Welcome to day two, in my opinion, Tuesday night of Beast Week college basketball reaction around the Southeastern Conference. Sorry, guys, I didn't go live last night. We had, again, I have a, what is it now, 12 months now, just turned a year the other day. Um, <laughs> had some baby issues um, in the middle of the night. So I'm sure some of you guys, again, when the Auburn game was in at 2 a.m., wanted to go live, but had to help the wife out. I'm sure you parents understand that, guys. But we have four phenomenal games to review. Going to get to the meat and potatoes of it. Uh, before we get started, guys, remember this reaction segment is brought to you by our buddies over at Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com and use code SECU at sign up to get $50 instantly when you play your first $5 or more lineup. A lot of fun, um, just little mix matches I like to do. I always bring up the time I had a fun time in the league. Neighbors, Jaden Daniels, a couple of years ago, doing one. Uh, from a football perspective as well, guys. But go check out our buddies over at Prospects. They do a phenomenal job. Uh, and use that code SECU um, to get $50 instantly when you play your first $5 or more lineup. But let's get right to it. Let's get to why you're here. Alabama beats Houston 85-80 in overtime. Really fun game. Pulling up the box score for you so you have a visual, folks. Uh, really fun game across the board. You know, I, mean, I was watching it while you're we going back and forth on the um, uh, college football playoff reaction show with Cole and Chris for you consistent SEC unfiltered um, users. But overall, but overall, man, back and forth, you know, the halftime, Houston was up 36-34. I feel like Alabama's rebounding really kept them in the game in the first half. It kept them in striking distance. Just, again, Baylor didn't shoot overly well. 36.7% from the field. 36.7%, as you can see right there, from three-point land. Alabama hadn't had this game where they just rained threes and it's been kind of bombs over Baghdad for people. We see that. I mean, we think about it. If you're really accustomed to Alabama basketball, the 2020-2021 game against LSU and Baton Rouge, they set an SEC three-point uh, record. A couple of times with Brandon Miller and them, against LSU Georgia come off the top of my head. I mean, they've had games even last year in the NCAA tournament where they just went off on people. Like, you've seen it before, folks. We haven't seen that through six games so far for Alabama and NATO. It's as much, but they're so versatile, so deep. I still, I don't think Alabama's the best team in the country right now. I, I think we'll talk about Auburn coming up, and I'm not, I'm not going to hide from that. Auburn has phenomenal wins, been playing better than anybody. I still think Alabama's the most talented and deepest roster. They're versatile, have not been great offensively but they're finding ways to win. I mean, they out-rebounded a team that prides themselves. Kelvin Sampson, this Houston Cougar team, prides themselves on being the more physical, the best rebounding teams on the offensive and defensive. How they out-rebounded them by, look at that number, guys, 48-39. 48-39, folks. That's big boy grown-up basketball. I mean, this is Alabama's third win in the past four years over Houston. We all remember the one. 21-22, 21-22, remember at the end, J.D. Davison with the block. Or you had Nato sh- waiting there to shake Kelvin Sampson's hand, Kelvin Sampson's son throwing chairs, remember that? Then 20-22, or 22-23, Brandon Miller then went into Houston and won. Then at night, so Alabama's had their fair share of success against phys- – again, the, the, people always say, Alabama oh, can't play against physical teams. I mean, they're 3-0 and against Houston in the last four weeks. I mean, the last four years. They can play against physical teams. I think this team's built like that. This was a Mo Diabati game, folks. Give Mark Sears his flowers. 24 points, four from 13. Got a lot of his points. Got 12 points from the free throw line. Got half his points from the free throw line. But that's what Mark Sears does. But I think the big hard hat guy that you have to talk about across the board here. Before we get back, I want to go over those turnovers real quick for Alabama. But I think like we couldn't not talk about Mo Diabati. 28 minutes, I think he played nine against Illinois the previous game. Three for eight from the field, four for four for the free throw line, played really good defense, 16 boards, 10 points, dude. This was a Mo Diabati game, and I saw post game. Mo said, Nate Oates told him that going into this one, this is your kind of physical presence. We need you against the Jawan Roberts of the world down there, banging around, getting rebounds. And that's what kept Alabama in the first half because the turnovers were bad. The turnovers were not good. But you got to give him credit where credit's due, man. I mean, Muhammad Diabati, Alabama doesn't get past the round of 32 last year against Grand King if they don't have Mo Diabati. Just a phenomenal performance across the board, really, from Alabama. Finding a way to win this game in overtime. Houston now 0-2 against the SEC. Uh, lost to Auburn two weeks ago. But, yeah, Mark Sears got a lot of his points at the free throw line. You'll take that. Troll right sell three from six, 50% from beyond the arc. You'll take that. Grant Nelson starting to come on these last two games, going back to the Illinois game in Birmingham, four for eight from the field, one from three. 
getting 10 boards, manning up down there, down on the glass. If anybody watched the postgame with Nate Oates, he mentioned how Grant played really well. Again, Grant Nelson, Muhammad Diabati, Darion Reed's defensive performance down the stretch. I mean, he's not going to show up in the box scores, but the way he could lock down L.J. Cryer down the stretch did a really good job. Uh, uh, locking down L.J. Cryer down the stretch. I feel like uh, L.J. Cryer, give him credit. Give him his flowers. Finished with 30 off 9 of 26, 2 from 8 from the field. Two assists. I feel like his legs got a little tired towards the end of the game. Again, Alabama um, was playing that drop coverage defensively, so they were giving up that little mid-range floater. And if you can consistently hit them, you, you can keep Alabama on kind of their heels. Again, when Alabama used to have Charles Bediaco in that front court, they used to play that drop coverage. They really couldn't do it last year because they had Grant Nelson out of his position play that five spot. But now he's back to his four. Alabama goes back to that drop coverage. It leaves a lot of mid-range floaters, teardrops in there. And let's give LJ Cryer this Houston credit team credit. They were hitting their shots. LJ Cryer had a shot at into regulation. Tend it. Missed it. Alabama hit a three to open up. I think it was Latrell Wright cell right out of the gate in overtime to kind of set the tone there. Alabama outscoring Houston seven to two um in overtime. So the thing, Alabama, right off the gate, man, Houston was in their face. Turnovers, man. 15. 15, but I think they had seven at half. So you had more in the second half. And I, I couldn't remember off the top of my head how many you had in overtime if you're Alabama. 15 turnovers, Houston had 12. But I think the real – I mean, the game, the game, this game never got over an eight-point lead for anybody. You see, you see, Houston's biggest lead was seven. So, I mean, this was back and forth the whole time. I think the real key to this, though, is when you're looking at the box score here and go back and watch the game like I did this morning, went back and watched the highlights – Alabama out rebounding Houston by nine boards was critical. Was critical. Out rebounded on the offensive end and defensive end. You can see that 20 to 8, 16, uh, 20 to 16 on the offensive side, on the defensive side, 28 to 23. Big boy performance for Alabama right now. They will play Rutgers tonight. What's it, that game's at is it 1030 Eastern. Let's see. I think it's at Rutgers, they yeah, 10 o'clock Eastern on TBS. So, yeah, and Rutgers won it overtime last night, the game after against Notre Dame. So, give Alabama the Flyers. That's a big boy win. That was a big boy win. Those are games you're going to have to have in tournament. Kind of felt like the North Carolina game for them last year in the round, in the Sweet 16 round. Like, those are close games. Someone has to step up, and Mo Diabati's been that guy for Alabama here in the first six games at times. And even ending the season last year, remember, they wouldn't have won that Grand Canyon game. So he kind of – he stood out to me. Mark Sears kind of getting his groove back again. Got half his points at the free throw line is what it is. But you'll take that. Mark Sears a phenomenal free throw shooter. Uh, I thought Grant Nelson stepped up. And then Darion Reed's not going to get talked about enough, but his defensive performance at the end is a true freshman in that environment against – one of the more disciplined teams, a team that does not beat themselves, like Kelvin Sampson and his Houston Cougars. Very impressive by Darian Reed and very impressive by Nate Oates and his Alabama staff. Again, they got Rutgers tonight, and then they will wait to see who they play on Saturday. I do believe it'll probably either be the winner of Oregon, San Diego State, I would say, that, that Saturday night matchup essentially for the championship, the players' area championship. I mean, you heard Latrell Wright sell, say it in the huddle. Guys, we, come on, let's go. Do you all want a million dollars? This is the players' era festival, guys, the first of it. NIL, I think up to $9 million are involved in it. I think the winning team gets a million dollars. Not every kid gets a million dollars, but the team gets to divide up a million dollars. So you know that extra juice is going to be there, and you heard the trail right, so bring it up. So you know it's in topics um, of conversations across the board. But, man, that was a good basketball game, fun basketball game um, to watch out in Vegas. Let's go to our next one, though. Remember, we had four games. Auburn continues to run through Maui, folks. Just doing a phenomenal job, getting a double-digit win over North Carolina, 85-72. to 72. Let me pull up. Let me share the screen for you. Let's pull it back up. I mean, dude, Janai Broom, guys. First, of all, we usually look at the overall team. You got to start with Janai Broom. Guys. He's playing the, – he's the best player in the country right now. 34 minutes, 9 of 18 from the field, 2 of 4, shooting 50% from beyond the arc, 3 of 4 at the free throw line, 19 rebounds, 23 points. Oh, and don't forget his three blocks too, folks. Janai Broom has just developed into this really, really, really good basketball player. And he was even two years ago, his first year. I mean, he, he was a really good player, I, I thought. I Phenomenal job coming over from a Nor Moorhead State. He's gotten better each year. That's a tribute. That's a um, compliment to Bruce Pearl and his staff to get him right. I mean, Aul Auburn's a deep, tenacious basketball team. They, they, it's kind of like Freddy Krueger. They don't stop coming. They play so good defensively. They can always go in this little 
14-2 run, 16-4 run, something like that. Again, you have, what, four out of your five starters finishing double figures. Chad Baker, Mazzara is kind of taking that next step. He's kind of came off to me as kind of their instant microwave, what Katie Johnson wanted to be. But Katie Johnson would take poor shots. It feels like CBM, Chad Baker, Mazzara, hasn't been doing that. And if he has, I mean, he's kind of been efficient with it a little bit. I mean, it, I mean, it is what it is. Denver Jones – uh, taking his game a little bit to the next level, two for five. Miles Kelly getting out of that horrendous Georgia Tech offense that he ran and fits a little bit more in this. Auburn's got some good puzzle pieces. Again, I think Alabama's roster is more talented than Auburn's, but I think Auburn's puzzle pieces are fitting together a little better right now. We're splitting hairs. They both have a win over Houston. Alabama will play North Carolina next week in the ACC-SEC Challenge uh, in the Dean Dome. So we'll see. But uh, overall, this game specifically, I feel like Auburn just kind of controlled it. I mean, they were up eight and a half. Again, they outscored UNC 45-40 in the second half. I mean, they controlled this game. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't think this is a very – and it's November. It's November 27th as we record this. I, I don't see this being a real Final Four team. But again, I don't know who they'll be matched up with the tournament, so I hate saying that. That goes against a lot of things I believe in to say that this early. But, I mean, that, it, outside of the front court, that back court misses Armando Baycott, and I always thought Baycott was a little overrated, if I'm being honest. I mean, outside of R.J. Davis, Seth Trimble, Elliot Cadeau do, does good stuff. But, I mean, I, I'm just not a big fan of Withers in Washington. I mean, Withers had a big mistake last year in the Sweet 16. He's not, I mean, uh, Vin Allen Lubin, the Vanderbilt transfer, coming off the bench for 10 points. I, I don't know. It's just that front court just does not really scare me. And you just watch the guys like – you watch guys – like all Janai Broom, Dylan Carwell, and Dylan Carwell plays his role very well for Auburn. Uh, just kind of, I don't know, just kind of dominate him. Kind of feel like this game wasn't even that close. I mean, it was up in the 16 18 range for most of the time. I think Cheney Johnson for Auburn's kind of taking that next step. Chris Moore's going to do some dirty stuff. He's not going to show up in the stat line. I mean, look, I mean, he's got a bunch of donuts, goose eggs in this stat line. But again, he plays hard, takes some charges, dives on the floor for loose balls. Everybody's kind of fitting in their role right now. It's kind of what you're thinking with Auburn. It's the total opposite of the same, fitting a square peg into the round hole. Auburn has, like, the cleanest round hole out there right now, and it is just a perfect fit right now. They are playing as good as anyone. I think they are the best team in the country. I think Janai Broom is the best player in the country right now. And they'll move on to play Memphis. Memphis in a, in a Maui Invitational Championship game. I did see Memphis in person against Alabama a couple weeks ago in an exhibition, and it was a total foul fest. I mean, nobody could foul out. So players taking advantage of it. But I think everybody's a little surprised Penny Hardaway's team's this far in this thing. I mean, people were talking about UConn, but UConn is 0-2, losing to Colorado. Um, then who did they lose to that first day? Who do UConn lose to the first – who do UConn lose to? Uh, oh, Memphis. Yeah, Memphis beat them. Controlled most of that game. Um, Memphis beat them, and then Colorado beat them yesterday. Dan early doing his antics. But, again, Auburn's setting up nice to win this tournament. I think they're an eight-point favorite going into tonight's uh, championship game at 5 o'clock. So, Auburn setting up to play real, or playing really good basketball now. Again, I, I would say hands down they're the best team in the country um, right now. I mean, massive wins. Wins over at Houston at the Toyota Center, uh, Iowa State. North Carolina, and again, I, I'm not that high on North Carolina. Again, I'm not that high on North Carolina heading into this one. But Auburn, just a, a deep team. It feels like everybody kind of understands their role. They understand their role. Give Bruce Pearl and them credit. See if they can go take home the trophy tonight. Texas A&M. Texas A&M, folks. What? Death, taxes, and A&M struggling in non-conference play, folks. Is that is that is that a fair assessment? Would we say that's a fair assessment across the board? I, I, I mean, I think it's very fair, if I'm being completely honest. I think it's very fair for sure. I mean, listen, this is back-to-back. -back. This is in their two losses, at UCF and Oregon and Vegas. This is the Players' Era Festival as well. Same tournament, just different division that Alabama's in. Same tournament. This is the money, million dollars on the line for the team with the best record. This is that. This is the second loss, though, and it's all been away from Reed Arena. Your home confines, like – they have blown a double-digit lead with the under ten minute and under ten minutes left in the game twice now against UCF and now Oregon. I, that can't keep happening. I mean, what what Oregon going a sixteen two run, multi a ten zero run, just ultimately and one by ten points, man. That can't keep happening. It, it, it just can't keep happening. I mean, this was a recipe for an AM win through the first thirty minutes of the game. Out rebounded Oregon. Uh, get some second chance points, kind of the Wade Taylor, 
uh, kind of the Wade Taylor show. I mean, it was really the Wade Taylor show for the most part. And I thought I got Zurich Phelps, the SMU transfer did well, 20 points, six for 18, four for nine for the four. Just Solomon Washington he did go out and look like a concussion protocol. As you can see, he didn't have much as a starter, but he went out early. I don't know. It's just for whatever reason, A&M away from home against solid competition against UCF opening night a couple weeks ago. And then yesterday against Oregon where they're up 10 with nine minutes left. Just blow it. Just collapsing away from Reed Arena in the last 10 minutes of the games, of these games. I mean, they could easily be 6-0 and right now, probably ranked in the top 15 at that point. Again, I think Oregon's solid. I, I do. I think Dana Altman and them do a solid job. I think A&M's better. They, to lose that game, it's got to be – that's a sour taste. And, again, I know Buzz Williams will talk about how, like, y'all – people would be shocked how we don't do a ton of just on-court – basketball development stuff early in the season. We're, we're trying to bond as a team. He gets them to read books in the offseason, and all that's phenomenal. I love the culture stuff. It's a buzzword, throw it around athletics, college athletics, professional uh, professional sports right now. But at some point, it, it has to be a thing now, you struggling this early in the season. Every year it feels like you're just collecting losses that you're like, we were up nine to ten points under ten minutes and two of our first six games this year on the road and can't close it out. That, that's hard to do, guys. And you got a veteran squad. you got a lot of guys who've played a lot of basketball. And, again, you look at the box score. I mean, it's a typical A&M game. I mean, look, Wade Taylor's going to shoot a bunch of shots. But Zurich Phelps is kind of in that same order. Those are the horses they're riding on offense. If they miss them, they're hoping they get some second-chance buckets with Anderson Garcia, Solomon Washington when he's in, and Farrell Payne. I mean, and they throw in Henry Coleman off the bench, Jace Carter, Manny Abasaki as well. I mean, that's, and C.J. Wiltshire fits in that mode a little bit. Like, there's not a question of when a and is going to start playing well. You see it every year, especially because he's had this core group of guys for a while. Like, that's what I'm talking about. Wade Taylor, Anderson Garcia, Solomon Washington, Henry Coleman. They've had these core group of guys outside of Boots Radford, who's obviously left the team. You could throw him in there for the last like kind of three years, and it's the same thing. Remember two years ago, they went to the Charleston Classic. I think it finished last, 0-3, dropped some games early last year. This year you're seeing it. Like I mentioned, the first 30 minutes in these road games are fine. It's the final 10 you can't close, and you lose by double digits. That's it. I mean, it's just an epic collapse. But you look at the box score and you go watch, read back, you go back and rewatch the highlight trick. AM was set up for a classic AM win. It's not always going to be pretty. It's not their style, but they weren't terrible. I mean, they're always going to shoot probably 36% or below, especially from three point range. They're going to get up, they're going to out rebound you. They're going to get a lot of offensive rebounds. Look, 21 to 11. It was a classic AM game, and then just you melt in the last 10 minutes. Melt, just complete meltdown. Just really disappointing matchup. A&M will move on. They'll play Creighton today. Again, the Blue Jays are very – Ryan Kalbrenner is the only thing really going for uh, Greg McDermott's team right now. I mean, Creighton isn't great. Uh, but that game will tip off at 6.30 on Max. If you have Max, go. If you don't have it, go subscribe. Guys, a lot of good TV shows on there. And obviously a lot of good basketball. Players there at a festival. 6 o'clock. Creighton sits at 21. But, I mean, Creighton's coming off back-to-back -back blowout at home against Nebraska. Um uh, and who was San Diego State really handled them yesterday. So, I mean, just a dominant performance. I mean, so, sorry, just a total meltdown by any of it. If I'm an Indian fan, that's frustrating. It's just the same thing over and over again. I, I, I don't really fall into like a lot of things are just uh, coincidences. Uh, coincidences. It is, it's a coincidence. This is a thing now. Three years in a row. I mean, come on. I mean, you still got some tough games down the stretch. I mean, you got Creighton tonight again. I think they should win that game. Wake Forest, Hunter Salas, and them are a good basketball team. Texas Tech and Purdue. I mean, that's your next four. Really, you know, they don't know who they're going to play in the last game on Saturday. Probably will be either Notre Dame or Houston, maybe. Notre Dame or Houston, I would think they'd probably play because Rutgers beat Notre Dame in overtime last night. Uh, but, I, I mean, you're going to play Creighton. Notre Dame or Houston, Wake Forest, Texas Tech, and Purdue. You need to go win at least three to four of those, I think, if you're Buzz Williams, then to make up for the two losses, just the last 10 minutes of the game meltdowns you've had in Orlando and Vegas against UCF um, and against Oregon. So, But A&M, disappointing, disappointing last 10 minutes if you're Buzz Williams and you're Texas A&M Aggie. And then Kentucky. Kentucky's defense was the story of the day, folks. Big Blue Nation. It was for sure the story of the day. Getting up a visual for you. 
pull up the graphic. Kentucky gets the 87-68 win over the Hilltoppers of Western Kentucky. Remember when Western Kentucky used to be like them in South Alabama used to be the team. Maybe maybe I'm too old for that. In the was it the Sun Belt? It kind of always felt like they did a really good job kind of controlling that conference. It felt like John Pelfrey and South Alabama would go back and forth. But sorry, I just bring that up. Just seeing the Hilltoppers, always traditional mid-major college basketball team to me. But the number eighth ranked Kentucky Wildcats, 87-68. This was the first night it felt like Kentucky wasn't completely on from a shooting standpoint. 40% from the field, isn't terrible. 27% from three-point range, it's their worst of the season. 69% from the free throw line, they could be better. I'm sure Mark Pope would tell you that. But the defense rebounding, out-rebounded the Hilltoppers, 54-41. Um, steals, they had five. Block, seven. Both teams had 11 turnovers. I mean, Kentucky controlled this game. But, again, even in their best – even in their worst night shooting, they still scored They still scored 87 points, folks. They still scored 87 points. I thought Andrew Carr was really good defensively going back and watching some of that. Otego away do, does a really good job. The Oklahoma transfer. I thought Jackson Robinson was really good defending. And then, obviously, the San Diego State transfer, I think one of the best on-ball guard defenders in college basketball, Lamont Butler, going to do Lamont Butler things, folks. I mean, he is. He had a steal last night. Again, what wasn't Kentucky's best overall offensive performance, but if you're Mark Pope, what you can take with this, and again, it's not a great Western Kentucky Hilltopper team. You, just, you sit there and you're seeing they're three and three. Not anywhere near to the ability that I was talking about them being back in their big um, heyday of the Sun Belt. But it, it shows you can go win games in different manners by 19 points, and you're up 21 at one point. Again, you're not going to shoot well every night. It's just – it's a percentage game, guys. You, even the best teams do not shoot well every night. I mean, look at Alabama. They haven't had a great shooting performance yet. But the best teams find ways to win when they're not playing their best or not shooting their best that night. If I'm a Kentucky fan, I take a lot from that. Get three to five starters um, scoring in double figures. You like what Andrew Carr doing, 10 boards. Amari Williams also had 10 boards, the Drake transfer. Phenomenal job. I mean, phenomenal job finding other ways to win. I bet Mark Pope secretly was kind of like, Obviously, I want us to make every shot we take, but I'm not upset we had to go play and try to find a way to win with our left hand a little bit. Now, were they really pressed in the last under eight minute timeout, under four time minute? Hell, even the under 12 minute timeout. Second, no, no, absolutely not. And they were up 12 and a half. But still, you like to be like, hey, defense needs to improve. But hell, we, we, we held Western Kentucky to 68 points. What's next for the Wildcats? Um, they will play Georgia State. On Friday, day after Thanksgiving, and then the ACC SEC Challenge next week, they will head to um, at Clemson. They'll play at Clemson, a team that was in the Elite Eight last year at Clemson, and they will play on Tuesday. So that'll be a Tuesday, Wednesday thing. And they get Gonzaga coming up right after that, that next Saturday. So it's a big, good win for Kentucky. Shows the defense is there. Offense was probably the worst night of uh, the season, but you still scored 87 points. So let's take it for what it was. But Kentucky's defense was definitely – the story of the day. So let's give Kentucky their flowers from that perspective. But guys, we had a phenomenal day on the hardwood yesterday. And we can, I'll show you, let's go look at some of the scores that'll be, let's look at some of the games that'll be happening today as well from the SEC. Um, before we get you out of here, we got at three o'clock, or sorry, 4 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, UT Martin, Tennessee. Tennessee currently favored by 38 and a half. Obviously, we think Tennessee should handle that. Memphis at Auburn for the Maui Invitational Championship game at 5 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. Auburn opens up and is an eight and a half point favorite over Penny Hardaway and them. Seeing both these teams play, um, Auburn's got the edge. Again, I think Auburn's the best basketball team in the country right now. Maybe not the most talented, but they definitely have the best player in the country. Well-rounded player now who is a threat from three-point land now in Janai Broom. Providence, Oklahoma. Oklahoma's first real test. That's why I've had them 16. I don't think they played a team with a winning record yet. Here we go. Bad Boy Motors battle for Atlanta. Let's go Sooners. 5 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2 against undefeated Providence. Again, how good is Providence? I don't know. Oklahoma's favored by two and a half in this one, but it is against another Big East team. It's against a Big East team. Virginia Tech, South Carolina, and the loser's bracket of the Fort Myers tip-off. I thought South Carolina played their best game of the year and a loss to Xavier the other day. They need to go get a win against a 500 Virginia Tech team. South Carolina favored by four and a half in this one. We mentioned it, AM Creighton in the Players' Era Festival. This game was already scheduled, but it just happens to be the two teams on that side that lost. That happened on the other side of Alabama, too. Uh, outside of Ryan Calvin, I don't think Creighton's very good this year, folks. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are going to say that out loud because people like to carry that Creighton flag. I'll say it. I don't think Creighton's very good right now. Coming off back-to-back 
blowout losses to Nebraska at home and in San Diego State yesterday. I think AM should get this one if they don't. It's disappointing, but AM's favored by three and a half. Lindenwood, 6 30 p- Lindenwood at Missouri, 6 30 p.m. on the ESPN plus. Uh, on ESPN plus Missouri's favored by 28 and a half. Missouri should handle this one. And then at 10 o'clock Eastern on TBS. Rutgers and Alabama both coming off overtime wins. Rutgers beating Notre Dame in overtime yesterday. Alabama, we discuss as we discussed, beating Houston in overtime yesterday, 85-80. Alabama opens up as a 10 and a half point favorite. So remember this players era festival. These first two games were already scheduled. I think they were supposed to do just like kind of a round robin and they changed. Hey, let's actually give a championship out because we got to give this extra million dollars out to a team. So it sounds like it's kind of probably going to be Alabama Rutgers. The winner of that will probably play the winner of San Diego State, Oregon. And on the other side with AM, uh, both these teams lost. So AM will probably play, AM Creighton will probably play the potentially the, if Rutgers loses to Alabama, probably one of them will probably play Rutgers because you got to think. I think they're trying to avoid AM and Alabama playing because, again, it's a, that's like they're going to play in conference play. I'm sure Buzz Williams and Nate Oates wouldn't be opposed, but they probably wouldn't be real fired up to play each other, especially AM and Alabama play early in conference play. We're not that far away from it. And then Creighton and Alabama play in a week and a half, two weeks in Tuscaloosa. They're not going to want to do that again. So, fully expect Alabama's third game on Saturday night to be uh, either San Diego State, maybe get a revenge game from the Sweet 16 game two years ago, or Oregon, who Alabama played Dana Altman team last year. Uh, in Panama City, Destin area. I forgot what the name of that tournament was. And I think AM will just depend what happens again because they're trying to cr- crisscross this, these pools now for Saturday night's game. I'm sure they'll announce them either late tonight or tomorrow what those matchups are, guys. But I love bringing it to you guys. Love bringing this reaction to you. Four big games. Bama gets a big win over the Kim Palm number one ranked team going into yesterday. Houston, 85 80 in overtime in the Players Era Festival. Auburn continues its run through Maui, getting a big win over North Carolina. They'll play for the championship game tonight against Memphis. Texas A&M, another double-digit lead blown in the last 10 minutes of the game this year through six games so far. A&M falters late, loses to Oregon in the Players' Era Festival. And then Kentucky, down not, wasn't a great night for them offensively, all things considered, still 87 points. But the defense was the story of the day, guys. But for Dave Shoemate, your host here, your head basketball analyst here at the SEC Unfiltered Channel, I hope you're having a phenomenal week. It's feast week. It's Thanksgiving week. If you don't tune in again, I hope you and your family have a phenomenal Thanksgiving week. Guys, it's SEC Unfiltered. If you don't like, subscribe. Go hit that notification bell already. Go subscribe to us, guys. We're doing a phenomenal job covering all things football, basketball, and baseball. There's no better SEC entity out there. Come give us a like, follow, get a rate review, guys. We want to see how we can improve as well. But I love you guys tuning in. we got a lot more basketball to come this week. Go check out our uh, – Previews from Rivalry Week as well on the gridiron. But for Dave Shumate and SEC and the SEC Unfiltered Family, you have a phenomenal week.